know what that is? <laughs> okay, this is, this is the Milky Way. This is the Great Rift, which uh, in Mayan cosmology is called uh, Sibalba, Sibalba Bay. And uh, uh, mythically what it is is the meeting is the opening of the cosmic serpent. Cosmic monster, alligator, uh, toad, serpent. And <clears throat> this is the horizon. This is the sun on the horizon looking east on the morning of 2012. And uh, so, of course, um, on that morning, it's the morning of the uh, uh, winter solstice. So the sunrise on the morning of winter solstice. What you would see is, well, actually, you wouldn't see it because the sun were rising. But <clears throat> if you were up before dawn, and, you were, and if, you had, if you had actually looked at the night sky for you know, weeks preceding and kept sort of at least oral records and some sort of written records, looked at it for months and years, you would know that on this morning, uh, if you could see beyond the obvious light of the dawn, you would see the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way stretching as an arc uh, over the space where the sun was about to rise, or was rising, I should say. And the path that the sun takes, of course, this is called the ecliptic. The ecliptic is just the, the path that the sun traces in the sky from uh, sunrise to sunset. And that path, of course, a certain number of degrees on either side of the, of the ecliptic gives us what we call the zodiac, right? the band of the zodiac. Okay. So <clears throat> on the morning of the winter solstice, 2012, the sun, uh, so on this winter solstice, the sun will rise. The sun, which is called the, uh, the first father, is going to be born or reborn out of uh, the mouth, which is also the womb, of the first mother, Sibalba Bay. So right here is called the first mother. So what we have, in other words, okay, well, the sun <clears throat> is uh, traditionally a symbol of the, uh, the king, the, the, would have been the king of uh, the Mayans. In Egypt, it's a, it's a symbol of Osiris or of Horus. It's, uh, the, the solar principle is a principle, is a principle of the, uh, the, the, the leader of men. The head of the state is also uh, psychologically the ego, the center of consciousness. So, first father is reborn, just as the year is reborn on that day. It's the it's the date after which, uh, of course, the uh, um, the days start getting longer. So it's the rebirth of the light, the principle of light, after the darkest part of the year. So this is the moment of the rebirth of the light in the year. But it also happens to be the only time <clears throat> in 5,000 years that the sun will be reborn through the womb of the cosmic serpent and exit the mouth of the cosmic serpent and be reborn on a cosmic level. So this is sort of what's happening. We have an image of cosmic uh, death rebirth that uh, is um, uh, synchronistically happening not only on the yearly day of the rebirth of the sun, but on a very special moment that only happens once in that great cycle, that great count. <clears throat> so that's pretty neat. Now, of course, we know that this great serpent is also our Milky Way galaxy that we are situated in, right? This spiral galaxy. We're sort of on the, somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> this is the view from the top. 
if you were to view it from uh, the side, of course, it would look a little bit like a, an egg, a flattened egg, like that. This is, and we are sort of here. But if you're looking towards the center of the galaxy, this is what you see. Now, <clears throat> The alignment of the Earth and the Sun on this uh, winter solstice, it only lines up with the center of the galaxy once in every 5,000 uh, so, uh, so or so years, this great count. So there is what's called a, a, an alignment, a galactic alignment with the center of the galaxy that is happening at this moment. Now, of course, it doesn't happen just at this moment. It's actually happening about uh, at least 30 years on either side of that moment. So you could say that the moment of 2012 actually began somewhere in the 70s or 80s and will go into the uh, uh, 40s or so, that larger orb, you might say. But it's centered on this date. Okay. So death rebirth. <clears throat> what we have then is a moment in time which uh, suggests, first of all, spatially, an alignment with the center of, of a whole. So we have the archetypal image of the mandala. Think earlier uh, at the beginning, I talked about this, this spatial mode of intuiting our wholeness as uh, being in the center. Of course, uh, Brian has really helped us see how contemporary cosmologist, cosmology um, implies that the center, physical center of the cosmos is actually everywhere. Right, so the center is everywhere. You are at the center. You are at the center. The center is everywhere. So uh, this moment in time is when that intuition of uh, the center, which is everywhere, is focalized into a particular moment of time. Okay. <clears throat> in that moment, of the center of the mandala is the moment of rebirth, death rebirth. Got that? So that's the temporal dimension. Death rebirth is time, process. Center is space. So the two complementary uh, archetypes, you might say, of wholeness are mandala, space, and death rebirth time. They're one and the same thing, but from the two different modalities of uh, space or time. Okay. You're going to have to probably fold some of this into our discussion, I would imagine. wanted to proceed to the code. Any, if any of you have read my book, you, you will see that there's, there's two chapters. One is called um, uh, the more fundamental, a more fundamental pattern, and then the great code. Well, the, the code here is actually uh, compressing both of those chapters, or at least the ideas that I, that I uh, introduce in both of those chapters into a single idea. And that is to get a sense of uh, the deeper structure of this temporal inflection of wholeness. Right? If we're trying to get at what this wholeness is, as process, as a temporal unfolding. Well, what is it? Well, uh, one way of looking at it is that uh, uh, it has a deep structure. Now, Brian already gives us a clue to that structure, which is the structure of all narratives, beginning, middle, and end. And we've been talking about uh, the end as the eschaton, uh, as uh, one manifestation of the third moment of that uh, triphasic structure, right? Beginning, middle, and end. But we can think of that, those three phases, uh, actually more particularly to get a sense of what the structure of that, that arc is. Because beginning, middle, and end is, is fine, but it's rather vague. You know, there are many beginning, middles, and ends. What is it about the middle phase? What is it about the beginning? What is it about the end? Uh, <clears throat> and the way that, one way of uh, thinking of that those three phases, and this is where a kind of Hegelian approach is helpful, is to think of them in terms of a movement from uh, identity, 
through difference or differentiation to a new identity. Okay. Identity, difference, or differentiation, new identity. These are phases, phases which uh, you might say they're logical moments, to use Hegelian terms, or phases of uh, not only a process, but process itself. So if you're trying to get at what is process, what is the deep structure of process or temporal unfolding, which is not just some random change, but is a meaningful unfolding. You might say uh, uh, an evolutionary unfolding or uh, an unfolding of uh, an organic unfolding. Well, arguably, it will have this, it'll take, it'll take this form. Okay. And once you get this, this is the code that I'm referring to. Once you get this relationship, which in, in one, uh, from one perspective is, uh, perspective is uh, very simple. Identity difference, new identity. Uh, you start to see, it becomes a, a code for um, understanding uh, enormous amounts of images and ideas and concepts and bringing clarity to enormous realms uh, of knowledge. Okay. If we go back now for a second to these stretches of time that we considered, we're not going to go through all of them. But uh, if we look at the original one, let's say we talked about the origins of Homo. I'm going to put Alpha and uh, Omega. So the, the mysterious origin of our species. So the mutation, hominization, the beginnings of hominization, which is really quite mysterious. Maybe we can bring it back 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million years. We don't really know, but uh, probably somewhere around 4 million. And the mystery of the goal. We don't really know where that process is ultimately heading. We don't know how it will ultimately look. But this alpha and omega of human origins and destiny you could say, um, are, is, a, is the largest framework that we might want to consider. I mean, we could go to, all the way to the Big Bang and then to whatever uh, might lie at the other end, but we needn't go that far. Okay? So you'd be happy that I'm not. I'm just amazed by it. <laughs> so there's an initial identity of Homo. Let's now even make it narrower, the last 200,000 years. We'll say Homo sapiens sapiens because we, we're relatively confident that our species uh, mutated and emerged around 200,000 years ago. So there is our, our initial identity. I'm going to put homo, homo sapiens. It's actually Homo sapiens sapiens, to be technical about it, our species. So about 200,000 years ago. Then there is uh, the um, exodus from Africa. There's not universal agreement, but growing consensus that uh, our uh, ancestors, the ancestors of all humans on the planet now, uh, emerged out of Africa probably about 70,000 years ago. 70K, so 70,000 years ago. 